Well, welcome back, everyone. So far, we've talked about what confounding means as a concept, developed some definitions, talked about stratification as a method for controlling confounding, and now I want to give you a formula for doing a stratified analysis using weights that were developed by Mantel and Hansel. So here's the citation. It was a paper, and notice that the paper was written back in 1959. So this is an old paper. This has been around for many, many, many years, for more than a half of a century. As I said, this was a very commonly cited paper in the 70s, the 80s, before regression became the more fashionable way to control for confounding. It was written by two people, Nathan Mantell and William Hansel. It contains various formulas, one of which is now used as the formula for doing a stratified analysis. Now, in their paper, they talked about retrospective studies. They were talking about case control studies. So they developed a formula for doing a stratified analysis when you have case control data. Case control data, what do we measure? Odds ratios, exposure odds ratios. We can interpret those as risk ratios, rate ratios from some underlying cohort study like we talked about. But mechanically, what are we measuring in case control study? Odds ratios. So their paper gave you the formula for calculating an odds ratio from case control studies. What others have done is use their method that was developed in that paper to develop similar formulas for risk ratios and rate ratios from cohort studies. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about both of those, cohort studies and case control study data in this, in this lecture. So if you have a cohort study, remember it could be closed or it could be open. If it's closed, you could measure cumulative incidence. You could measure your data. You could display your data in forms of a two-by-two two table, and you could measure risk ratios and odds ratios from that two-by-two two table. If your cohort were open, you'd be measuring incidence rates. You'd be measuring person time among the exposed, person time among the non-exposed. You'd be measuring rate ratios. Now, the formula for the adjusted risk ratio using Mantle Hansel's formula is the same as a formula for the adjusted rate ratio. And basically, this is what the formula looks like. What you're going to be doing is for each of your, you're going to take your data set again and divide into subgroups. For each of those subgroups, you're going to be measuring either a risk ratio or a rate ratio. RR sub I means the risk ratio or the rate ratio for the ice stratum. You have a risk ratio for the young people, a risk ratio for the old people, or a rate ratio for the young people, a rate ratio for the old, old people. In either case, RR can stand for that risk ratio or rate ratio. Sometimes RR stands for relative risk. I've heard a few of our, of our lecturers, our guest lecturers, talk about relative risks. They stand for that generic term, relative risk, can stand for a risk ratio or for a rate ratio. Sometimes it's even used, stands for an odds ratio. But RR, we all sound like pirates today, can stand for either risk ratios or rate ratios. What Mantle Hansel formula says, take the risk ratio for a particular stratum, weight it, multiply by some weight, do that for all the stratum, add them up, that's what that sigma sign represents, I'll show you an example in a minute, and then divide by the sums of the weight. So Mantle Hansel will give you a weighted average adjusted measure for your risk ratio, rate ratio. Well, if you go to the original papers, the formulas for those are actually in this other pot, mathematically. What it says is we're going to do the following. For each of our tables, now let me go back to the previous, previous slide to show you a typical table. Let's suppose we have a two-by-two two table. We're measuring risk ratios. And this two-by-two two table might be for the young people. So each of these numbers could have a 100 corresponding to the first of your two-by-two two tables, the young smokers and the non young non-smokers. What Mantle Hansel's formula says is take the number A, the number of exposed people who got disease, the smokers who develop heart disease, multiply it by the total number of non-smokers, and then divide that product by T, the total number of people in that table. So what the formula says, again, is take A, the number of exposed people who got disease, times N0, the number of total number of non-exposed people, and divide that by T, the total number of people in that table. Do it for each of your separate strata and then add them up and put that number in the numerator. And then go back and start all over again for each of your tables. You're going to look at the, the number of non-exposed people who got disease. 
multiply that by the total number of exposed people, N1, and divide that by that same number T, and do that for each of the tables. So the formula says, for each of your table, take the number of non-exposed people who got disease C, times the total number of exposed people in the table N1, and divide by T, do that for each of your separate tables, and again, add that up. Mathematically, using that ratio of those two summations is the same as doing a weighted average of the, of the separate risk ratios for each table, where the weights turn out to be this number. C, again, is the total number of non-exposed people who got disease, and one is the total number of exposed people you had, and T is the number of total number of people in that table. So that's the weighting formula that Mantle Hansel says. For each table, calculate a risk ratio and weight it by this number C times N1 over T for that table. Now the first time I saw that formula, I had the, probably the same reaction you're having. Why does this number C times N1 over T reflect how much information there is in a table? Well, mathematically, this number C times N1 over T can be re-expressed as a product of three quantities. T, which is the total number of people in the table, N1 times N0, the number of exposed times the number of non-exposed people in the table, divided by T squared, and C over N0, which is the cumulative incidence of disease among the non-exposed people. So why are these three things reflecting information? Because they're combining to give you the weight that Mantle Hansel suggested using. Well, let me ask you some questions. I'm going to show you a couple of tables and ask you which one do you think would have more information if you were doing a study. So here's the first question. Suppose you had a choice of either having a table, we'll call it table A, which has a thousand people total in it, or another table, table B, that only has a hundred people. Which table would you expect would have more information to measure the association between exposure and disease, say calculating a risk ratio? Well, if you think about it for a minute, I'd rather have more people in my study. The more people I have, I get a feeling the more information I have. So I'd probably prefer table A over table B, the table with the bigger value for T. T, again, is the total number of people in that table. 1,000 people for table A. Only 100 people for table B. Table A has more people, more information. Okay, let me ask you another question. Let's suppose table A with its 1,000 people had 999 smokers and only one non-smoker. Do you still think it's very informative to, to answer the question, what's the effect of smoking on heart disease? It has lots of information about smokers and their risk of getting heart disease. It's got 999 smokers, but it only has one non-smoker. Not much information to estimate a non-smoker's risk of getting disease. Even though you have 1,000 people in that table, you might say, mm, I'm not so much sure how much information I have now about measuring the effect of smoking on heart disease. Well, if table B, on the other hand, has fewer people, only 100, if it happens to have roughly equal numbers, in this case, exactly equal numbers of smokers and non-smokers, you might start saying, aha, I got more information now in table B, despite the smaller overall numbers of people. So another measure of information is how relative the sizes are of the two groups you're comparing. And all things being equal, you'd like to have roughly equal numbers of exposed and non-exposed people, as table B has. Okay, let me ask you one other thing. Let's suppose now we have two tables, A and B, each have a thousand people, each have 500 smokers and 500 non-smokers, so they're the same so far. But table A shows 100 people getting disease among the non-smokers while table B only has 10 people getting disease. Remember I've said a few times the dark side of we epidemiologists. We're rooting for people to develop the outcome because you have to have sufficient numbers of outcomes in your groups to be able to say whether the outcome is more common among the exposed and the non-exposed. And the non-exposed people are sort of like giving the baseline risk of disease in your study of what the non-smokers have. All things being equal, I'd, ha I'd like to have more disease the baseline risk of disease in table A is 100 cases out of 500 people, while in table B it's only 10 cases out of 500 people, and the risk is greater in table A. There's more, more outcomes, more information. So it turns out 
that that mental Hansel weight, and I can go back to four slides to show you that, this weight is equal to the product of three terms reflecting those three sources of information. The mental Hansel weight C times N1 over T is the product of the total sample size. The middle term will be largest when you have more balance. So the middle term will be maximum when you have equal numbers of exposed and non-exposed people. And the last term is measuring the baseline risk of disease, what exists in the non-exposed people. So the mental Hansel weight is incorporating in one number those three separate components of information that, we, that we'd like to incorporate into a measure that describes how much information there is in a two by two table. So going back to that slide, mental Hansel's weight is reflecting both the total number of people in, in the study the balance of exposed and non-exposed people, and the baseline risk. So it's reflecting all three components, and that's why it's a good measure of information. Now, before I give you a numerical example just to demonstrate this, remember Mental Hansel also, and I shouldn't say also, they wrote a paper referring to case control data. So in their paper, you will see the formula for their odds ratio estimate adjusting for a factor through stratification. It's going to be a weighted average of the odds ratios you get from each of your say strata, your young people, your middle-aged people, your old people. Each of them gives you an odds ratio. You weight it by a number reflecting information. You do a weighted average. Well, the weights used in the mantle Hansel weights for odds ratios are different from those for risk ratios. They're different from case control studies than for cohort studies because remember, in a case control study, it's the controls that reflect the source population. In a cohort study, it's the entire data set that reflects the source population for your cases. So this is the formula for the odds ratio, mental Hansel adjusted estimate for the odds ratio from stratified analysis. It again is equal to a ratio of two summations of products we, obtain, we obtained from tables. And essentially it is again a, a measure that weights individual odds ratios from individual tables by how much information it is in each of those tables. So let me end by giving you an example of how to do a mental Hansel calculation from, from, from tables, from stratified analysis. I'll give you in the next lecture an exercise to try on your own. But this is a data which I borrowed from a textbook by Ken Rothman. I gave the reference down the bottom. It was a cohort study, an open cohort study, looking at the relationship between the exposure, which was, which was sex, males versus females, and the outcome mortality. What they had was 2,465 person years of observation of men, among men who had been diagnosed with this con condition known as trigenital neuralgia, looking at the rate of developing disease. 90 men developed the disease, the mortality rate would be 90 divided by 2,465 person years. That's a mortality rate of 3.65 deaths for every 100 person years of observation. They also observed 3,946 person years of observation for women, also diagnosed with trigenital neuralgia. 131 of them developed disease. Their mortality rate would be 131 divided by 3,946 person years of observation, which is the same as 3.32 deaths for every 100 person years of observation. You can calculate a rate ratio dividing 3.65 by 3.32. We come up with a value 1.0 excuse me, come up with the value 1.1 as your estimate for the crude measure of association. Okay, let's suppose we're now stratified by age. We have, for simplicity, two age groups, a young group, less than 65, and an older group that's 65 or older. It turns out that among all the person years of observation of your men, 949 of them came from older men and 1,516 from younger men. On the other hand, among all the person years observed among women, 2,245 came from older women and 1,701 from younger women. It turned out among the men, 76%, 76 of your deaths happened among the men who are older than six, 65 or older, only 14 from those under age 65. And among the women, 121 deaths occurred among women who were 65 or older, and only 10 amongst women who were younger than 65. What if you did separate calculations, one just looking at the young men versus the young women, another looking at the old men versus the old women? Among the young men versus the young women, looking at the youngest stratum, your value for the young 
rate ratio would be 14 deaths divided by 1,516 person years. Div that quantity is divided by the mortality rate among the young women. 10 deaths divided by 1,701 person years of observation. That gives you a rate ratio a little bit bigger than one and a half, 1.57. If you look now among the older group, the mortality rate among the old men, 76 deaths out of 949 person years of observation, divided by the mortality rate among the older women, 121 deaths divided by 2,245, gives you a mortality rate ratio, which is a little bit less than one and a half. So it looks like, regardless whether you're looking at young people or old people, the value for the rate ratio you calculate from these data suggests that men's rate of developing disease is roughly one and a half times that of women. A little bit bigger than one and a half, 1.57 among young people, a little bit less than a half, one and a half, 1.49 among old people. Since they seem very similar, let's average them together into one number. Let's use the mantle hansel formulas now to come up with a single age-adjusted rate ratio. Remember the formula says for each of your tables, look in, do two calculations. One says you look at the number of exposed people A, multiply it by the total number of non-exposed people N0 and divide by T. So for the young people, A is 14. The total number of non-exposed, in this case, person years and, uh, among the, the non-exposed people, females, is 1,701. And we divide that by the total amount of person years, T, which is 3,211. So it's, it's going to be 14 times 1701 divided by 3,217. We do the same calculation now in the older group. Total number of exposed people dying, 76, multiplied by the total number of person years from the non-exposed group, 2,245. That gets divided by the total number of people, three person years, 3,194. 76 times 2,245 divided by 3,194. And now we do the same, a similar calculation for the denominator calculation of the mantle hansel. We go back to the tables and now look at the total number of cases of death among the non-exposed people, C, times the total number of person years among the exposed people, among N, men, N1, divided by the total amount of person years. So for the first table, we take the Total number of deaths in the non-exposed, 10. Multiply it by 15, 16, the total amount of person years among the exposed, and divide by 3,217. 10 times 1516 divided by 3,217. We do the same calculation for old people. We have 121 deaths among the females, 949 person years among the exposed men, in total 3,194 person years. So it's going to be 121 times 949 divided by 3194. You go through the calculation, you get a value of 1.5, which is an average of the 1.49 we saw in the older group with the 1.57 we saw in the younger group, weighting those by the mantle hansel weights. Now this might seem like a lot of calculations. I'm going to ask you to do some hand calculations for our homework. And, in X, and I'm going to give you a problem set to look at in a second. But Stata will do this for you. Stata will do all the calculations. So you don't have to do this, the hand calculations in practice. But once you do one calculation and get an appreciation of where the numbers come from, you'll be better off now interpreting the result that the Stata software package will give you. So this will be done very quickly by Stata. Uh, in the future for future homework exercises, but we'd like to give you an example or two to do them by hand just to get an appreciation for it. So what do we conclude from these data? Is there evidence that age is a confounder? And let's go through the steps using both the definition and that working method of comparing crude to adjusted measures. So first let's use the definition. Is there evidence that age is associated with the potential confounders with the exposure sex? Well, in our data set, among the men, we had 2,465 total person years of observation. 62% of it, or 1,516 of those person years, happened among men who were young. On the other hand, we, for women, the non-exposed group, we had 3,946 total person years of observation, and only 43% of them, or 1,701, happened among the younger women. 
So there is a difference in the distribution, the age distribution of the person years for the men, the exposed group, versus the women, the non-exposed group. The men are younger. More of their person years are coming from, the younger, uh, uh, from younger individuals. So age is satisfying the first criteria for confounding. Is there evidence that age is re independently related to the outcome, which was mortality in this data set? Well, let's compare the mortality rates of young people versus old people. Let's just do it, for example, among the non-exposed people, the females. We could do it among the men if we want. Either way, we're looking at the independent relationship that age, the potential confounder, has with the outcome mortality. Well, among females, the mortality rate among young females is 0.59 deaths for every 100 person years of observation. It jumps by a factor of nine when you look at the old females, where the mortality rate is more than five, 5.39 deaths for every 100 person years of observation. Same message if we, you've seen if we just look at men. Young men have a mortality rate of 0.92 deaths for every 100 person years. It jumps by a factor of almost nine when you look at the older men with their mortality rate of, of 8.01. So in the data, there's evidence that age is a confounder because it has different distributions among the exposed and the non-exposed, males versus females, and it has an independent association with the outcome. So it looks like age is a confounder. But there's an easier way to get evidence for age being a confounder. Let's compare our results. When we did the crude analysis, we saw a crude rate ratio of 1.1. When we did the adjusted analysis using stratification with the mantle Hansel weights, we got adjusted rate ratio of 1.5, a different answer. There's evidence here that age is a confounder because we're getting different values between the crude and adjusted measures of association, and that's what a confounder should do. So why are we getting a different answer? Why is the rate ratio in the crude analysis less than it is in the adjusted analysis? because the exposed people have one bad thing going for them and one good thing going for them. The bad thing is that they're men, and men have higher rates of dying than women. But the good thing is that they're younger than the women, and younger age has lower rates of dying. So that's why these two effects working in opposite directions give you a crude measure, 1.1, that's less than what we see when we adjust for age using Mantle Hansel's formula. So, this is an example of using stratified analysis using the mantle hansel formula. We'll give you an example of doing one by hand in the next lecture. But before we leave, let me just summarize some of the good features of stratification. Hopefully you'll agree with me that it's intuitive. The idea of making subgroups from your data set that you have free of confounding by a stratifying factor is a simple way to avoid confounding, to control for confounding. It's somewhat simple. Yeah, there's a lot of calculations there. But all you had to do is multiply and divide and add some numbers together. It wasn't a huge uh, task for you mathematically. Um, but it has some limitations. What I've done is just control for a single factor like age. What if you had multiple confounding factors? You want to know whether smokers are more likely to get heart disease. You might have to control not only for age, but for blood pressure, cholesterol levels, physical activity, lots of potential confounders. Well, if you try to stratify your data set simultaneously by more than one confounder, say you stratify by age, and say you're lucky, you just have to make two straight, a young versus old. But if you also have to stratify further by blood pressure, and let's say you're lucky, it's just hypertension, no hypertension, suddenly your two straighter have become four straighter. You have young people with hypertension, young people without hypertension, old people without hypertension, old people with, hyper, uh, with hypertension. If you have to further stratify by cholesterol and you're lucky there's just two categories to cholesterol, now you have eight strata. Physical activity, if it's binary, will give you 16 strata. The more factors you stratify, the more strata you get. The more you have to spread your data set into more thinly groups of people, the more difficult now it is to get a, to get a precise estimate of the association between your exposure, smoking, and your outcome, coronary heart disease. So as a result, stratification is not practical when you have many potential confounders. But there's another nice feature about stratification that's going to come into next week's lectures. It's going to provide us a simple way for looking at a different concept, something called effect modification. We'll hold that off until next time. So the next time we get together, I want to give you a problem set and ask you to use Mantle Hansel's formula. 
and to answer a question whether a factor is a confounder or not. I'll see you then.